How many of you have ever received unfair treatment? Jesus said it is impossible that no offenses should come. Do you have the right to be offended? Offense is a snare, a trap. An offense is the bait of Satan. The bait of Satan. John Bevere's best-selling book has changed lives all over the world. God's word, his promise, will always come to pass as long as you don't get offended. And now, John Bevere Ministries presents The Bait of Satan Curriculum, a 12-part series designed to free you from the snare of offense. What you do with the offense will determine your future. How do you define holiness? How can you come up to God's level of thinking? These are only two of the questions John deals with in Lesson 11. Revenge, the trap. We're in Lesson number 11. Can you believe we're this far? In the Bait of Satan video curriculum. You know, can I read to you just a couple testimonies? Would that be all right? You know, the Bible says they overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Amen? I, you know, I get these testimonies and my staff shares some of them with me. because. So, but I'm telling you, it just really blesses my life to see how God t loves his people and touches his people and can use books to do it. The first book I, that I read the, was The Bait of Satan. It was about a year ago. When I read the first chapter, I put the book down saying arrogantly in my heart, Oh, I don't have an offense. This book is not for me, but for so-and-so. So the book sat on my shelf. Weeks later, the Holy Spirit literally drove me to the book, and I picked it up and began to read it again. This time, I listened to God within my heart. It brought a healing in my life and exposed an area that God had been trying to deal with me on. That's Patty from Hawaii. We have several. I just, just let me, um, um, just let me read one more here. We have so many, but you know the the, the testimony that really, really. Well, let, let me just read this one. Whether it's air rage, road rage, or put down humor, or sit, sitcoms, society today has become more rampant with arrogance and indifference. I felt myself becoming drawn into it, defending myself against perceived injustices, real and imaginary, and in the process realized how unhappy I'd become. While visiting Pensacola and subsequently reading your book, The Bait of Satan, your inspired words about dealing with the sin of offense were able to help me immeasurably, not only with regard to authority, but in everyday life solutions as well. From store clerks who don't say thank you to people who don't use their, turn their signals, I thought I'd, I'd grown up with strong Christian influences. I'd long since developed a disdain for Christianity because of the negativity and control tactics I'd experienced. But your words awakened me to the realization I'd no longer have to extract my love and validation from others, rather through Jesus. That's Doug, Louisiana. You know, we, we get these time and time again, and I'm telling you, just to see how God has used this message all over the world, watching people coming forward in conferences, 50% to 80% of the people. And then the testimonies we get of how their lives have been trained, changed. The bait of Satan, offense, is literally the trap of the devil to destroy the call of God on your life in these last days. And uh, there is a man named Cole Stringer from Australia who wrote a book, and I just read his book two days ago. And it's called Take Your, Cage, Take Your Hand Out of the Cage, Monkey. And uh, this Australian discovered how the uh, people out in the bush catch, catch monkeys. You know how they catch monkeys? What they do, now this is an amazing thing, they put a banana on the inside of the cage. All right? There's no doors inside of the cage. It's just a cage, a little round cage. But the thing is, the cage is only wide enough for the monkey's hand to go through like this. And what the monkey does is grabs the banana. But when he grabs the banana, he can't pull his hand back out because it's too narrow. And then when all these monkeys grab all these bananas and all these cages, then out come the guys with the baseball bats. And they start hitting the monkeys over the head and killing them. And these monkeys know exactly what these guys are doing. And they go right down the row, killing them just like that, or putting them out and bringing them to something else, or whatever they're doing. They go right down the row. And even though these monkeys are watching and know exactly what's going to happen, they won't let go of that banana. Now, that is such a perfect illustration of somebody that picks up an offense. Especially after you've heard what you've heard these past several weeks in these lessons. You know the consequences. It's made so clear in the Word of God. But yet, you have to hang on to that offense. Let go of it. Get your hand out of the cage, monkey, is what he says, right? An offense is a serious thing. I will review again. It is the bait of Satan. 
to pull you into his trap. Luke 17 verse 1 says, It is impossible that offenses will not come. Everybody say impossible. But what you do with the offense will determine your future. Either you will become stronger or you will become bitter. An offense is from the Greek word scandalon, which is an old Greek word which was used to describe the bait stick of a trap that hunters would use to catch small animals and birds in. They would put the bait on the scandalon. The animal would take it and the cage would either capture it or kill it. Right? Thereby, an offense is the bait of Satan to pull you into captivity. You will have the opportunity to be offended, but it will determine your future on how you handle it. Tonight, I want to talk to you some more about what we've been talking about. Not letting go of an offense. Now, when a person refuses to let go of an offense, the reason is, is because he feels that the person that has offended him owes him something. Do you remember the last parable that we talked about in the last lesson? Remember the unforgiving servant? Do you remember that? When his fellow brother did him wrong, what did he do? He threw him into jail, right? Until he should, what? Pay what he owed. When you hold an offense against somebody, you feel that they owe you something. You feel like you have a debt that has not been satisfied. In actuality, you are setting yourself up to be the judge because you determine what is owed to you. But really, there is only one judge, the Bible says, and that is God. When you hold on to that debt, you are holding on to unfulfilled revenge. Isn't that true? Because you want revenge, re revenge is your payment. Isn't that true? Now, bitterness is nothing more than unfulfilled revenge. It is an offense that is allowed to take root into a person's heart. You have not had your revenge, and it takes root and it grows. When a bitter root grows in a person's heart, the Bible says that it will defile you. The Bible says that we are to examine our hearts carefully, lest there be in us any root of bitterness by which many have been defiled. That is Hebrews chapter 12. Let me say it again. We are to examine ourselves carefully. Everybody say carefully. carefully. Lest there be any root of bitterness by which many have become defiled. Now, a root is something that starts out as a seed. The seed is a fence. Are you with me? If that seed is watered, if it is nurtured, it will grow. What it grows into is a very destructive plant in your life. It will defile you. I think the person that exemplifies this better than anybody else is a young man named Absalom. If you look at David, remember we talked about David several lessons ago, how that David was severely mistreated by Saul, but David did not take the bait. He was not offended. When Saul was judged by God, what did David do, folks? David, what? Taught all the men of Judah a love song. He grieved over Saul being put to death. And he blessed his descendants. That is not the sign of a bitter man. That is a sign of a man with a heart after God. However, David had several sons. Later on, he got the kingdom. He had several wives and several sons from each of those wives. Are you with me? Go with me, please, to 2 Samuel. And we will start here, talking about one of his sons, whose name is Absalom. 2 Samuel, please, the 13th chapter. Verse 1, after this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister, whose name was Tamar. And Ammon, the son of David, loved her. Ammon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick, for she was a virgin, and it was improper for Ammon to do anything to her. Now, David's got several wives, all right? Ammon is his firstborn son by one wife. Absalom is his thirdborn son, but she's through another wife. So both boys have the same father, David, but different mothers. Absalom has a sister that's gorgeous, all right? Tamar. Ammon, the firstborn son, is lovesick over her. So he's losing weight. He's wanting her so bad, but it was not proper since she was his half-sister. So one of David's uh, nephews, a very cunning man, says to Absalom, hey, why are you, you losing weight? You're one of the king's sons. This is what you need to do. Pretend like you're sick. And when David inquires about your sickness, ask the king, to please send Tamar in to feed you by her hand, that you will recover. So he listens to 
one of David's brother's sons advice, and he does it. He pretends he's sick. He's lying on a bed. When the king comes to see him, he says, please have Tamar come and feed me. So the king orders Tamar to come and feed him. When Tamar makes him the couple cakes to feed him, Ammon then sends all the servants out of his quarters. And when he does, he locks the door and he forces Tamar and he rapes her. Now Tamar is trying desperately to stop him. She said, please ask the king, but he does and he rapes her. So after he rapes her, the Bible says that his hatred for her was even greater than his love was for her before he raped her. Isn't that interesting? We could preach on that one for a while. And so he puts her out. She says, no, now what you're doing is worse than me than raping me. And he still doesn't listen or he throws her out. When, she hear, when, when this happens to her, she takes her robe of many colors because the king, king's virgin daughters wore, wore beautiful robes. She tore her robe and she put ashes on her forehead. And she went to her brother's home, Absalom, and she mourned. Now, Absalom, in seeing his sister raped by his half-brother to Ammon, was furious. And he hated his brother. So for two years, he waited for David to avenge his sister. But David heard about it, was very angry, but didn't do anything. Are you with me? The fact that David didn't do anything infuriated Absalom. And so Absalom now finally says, my father's not done anything, I'm going to take matters into my own hand. And so Absalom plans a party for all the king's sons. He hires two scoundrels and says, when I give the signal, when Ammon's good and drunk, rise up and kill him. He waits, he does it, and Ammon is put to death. All the king's sons flee. Absalom then flees to a place called Geshur and stays there for three years. After three years, Joab says, hey, look, the king has been comforted about the death of his son Ammon. We really need to see Absalom come back because he's lost two sons. Let's get the one back. So Joab goes to the king, and Joab, through a woman, a wise woman, persuades the king to bring Absalom back. Absalom is then brought back, but the king says, no way will I see his face. So for the next two years, King David refuses to see the face of Absalom. So now it's been five years. Now you have to understand something. Absalom got his revenge on Ammon, his brother. But he's still offended with dad for not doing anything. And that offense has been in that boy's heart for five years. <clears throat> Are you with me? That offense has grown. It has, it has taken root and grown. And now it's festering worse and worse and worse. It's never been dealt with. You don't know how many people I have met in the church that have not dealt with certain offenses in their life. And those offenses have been growing for years. And the sad thing is, folks... A plant is easy to pluck up when it's young because the roots are not very deep. But if you fester and you water that thing for years, it does take some effort to get it out. That is why the Bible says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You do not want to allow a seed of offense to germinate in your heart overnight. You do not avoid offenses. You confront offenses. And we will talk about that in the next lesson. You have to deal with them. It's very simple. It's done before the throne of God, but it's got to be dealt with. Amen? Yeah. Now, Absalom has had this thing growing in his heart for five years. Five years. So you know what? He's still offended with Dad. And finally, David says, all right, bring him before me. And he comes. Absalom bows down, kisses the king's hand, and now he's restored but the offense is still there. So what does Absalom begin to do? Absalom begins to provide for himself horses and men to run before him, and he stands outside the gate of the city, and all the people that are coming in that have cases that they need the king to hear, the king's busy, and Absalom says, oh, if I was ruler in Israel, I would judge your case. So the Bible says that he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now, folks, listen to me. Do you know how many times this has happened in churches? Associate pastors picked up an offense with the senior pastor, and they never dealt with it, and they begin to steal men and women's hearts in the church, and a few years later, there's a church split. You don't want to be an Absalom, because you're about to hear the outcome of an Absalom.
Do you know what ran through Absalom's head? My father. <laughs> he sure has the people deceived. Hides behind this fake worship of Jehovah. Ha! <clears throat> His own daughter gets raped and doesn't do anything about it. Well, no wonder he can't do anything about it because of what he did to his own servant's wife, Uriah the Hittite. <clears throat> raped his wife, and then he murders Uriah to cover it up. Ha! And Saul, he lost his kingdom because he just spared one king and a few animals. My father rapes a woman and then kills her husband to cover it up. And then he's Mr. Worship man. Oh. Doesn't do anything for my sister. See, it's festered. He's been thinking about this a long time. Are you getting this? Good. See, folks, let me, let me tell you something. I want to read you the back of the book. <clears throat> Are you compelled to tell your side of the story? Do you fight thoughts of suspicion and distrust? Are you constantly rehearsing past hurts? Have you lost hope because some, what, uh, somebody else did to you or, or somebody close to you? This is exactly what's going on. He's never dealt with the offense. So now he stole the hearts of the men. Why? Because he's justified it. My father is so, such a jerk. He's so hypocritical. There's no way he's qualified to rule. I mean, if Saul lost his kingdom for just sparing the king, my father, why should he have the kingdom? So he steals the men's hearts. And then he takes over Israel and marches on the throne with soldiers. And David's servants say to him, your, your son has, won, has stole Israel from right underneath you. And David has to leave. And of course, God's hand is on David and his men. And shortly after that, Absalom is put to death. I mean, even David gave the order, don't put him to death. But he was still put to death because I believe it was the judgment of God. It's very severe when you rise up against the Father, folks. God does not take that lightly. I mean, David had the man executed who even said that he killed Saul, but he didn't do it. It's a very serious thing when you rise up against the Father. And so Absalom is put to death. Now here is a young man who would have been a potential king, but his whole life was destroyed because of unfulfilled revenge. It wasn't, listen to me, it wasn't embezzling funds. It wasn't homosexuality. It wasn't adultery. It wasn't murder. It wasn't rape. The whole root was an offense that grew in to bitterness, unfulfilled revenge. Several years ago, I was preaching in a church in Florida. And uh, I just got done preaching on the bait of Satan. A woman comes up to me in the church. She said, Pastor John, while you were preaching, I just felt kind of an ant on the inside of me. She says, now I've forgiven my ex-husband and everything's fine, but I don't understand why was I feeling a little uncomfortableness on the inside of me. And I mean, the Spirit of God just really, really led me. I just looked at her and I said, well, that's because you haven't forgiven your ex-husband. She said, well, I have. I've forgiven him. I've cried. I've wept. I've released him. I said, no, you haven't. She said, yes, I have. She started getting a little upset. She said, yes, I have. I've released him. I've prayed. I've released him. I've cried. I, I've let him. Go. I've forgiven him. I said, no, you haven't. Well, then she started getting really upset. And she said, finally looked at me because I kept saying, no, you haven't. No, you haven't. She said, well, help me. I said, well, why don't you tell me what your husband did, your ex-husband did? She said, okay. She said, we were pastors. He left me and ran away with a very prominent woman in our church. Left me and my kids with nothing. And she said, John, he has blamed me all these years. He said that I was a hindrance to his ministry and the call of God in his life. And that God always intended for him to marry that woman, not me. And that it was the will of God that he should have married her. Well, now that's perverted as the day is long, but you know. So he really had wounded this woman. She said, now I'm married 
I have a new husband. He treats me fine. I have this good pastor now, who she worked for. She was the secretary of the church. She said, I have a hard time relating to my husband. I have a hard time relating to my pastor. I said, well, that's because you haven't forgiven your ex-husband. She said, but I have. I said, uh, keep going. She said, well, all these years he's blamed me. And she says, he's never come back once and said, I'm sorry. I said, stop right there. We just hit the unfulfilled revenge. She looked at me. She said, what? I said, listen, your unfulfilled revenge with your husband, your ex-husband, it's not alimony. It's not child support because you got a new husband taking care of you, taking care of your kids. I said, it's not the house. I said, what your unfulfilled revenge is, you just want him to come back and say, I was wrong for him to apologize. I said, ma'am, if Jesus would have waited for us to come back and say, I'm sorry, he never would have forgiven us at the cross. And she looked at me and her eyes got big like that. I said, ma'am, when he hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He wasn't just talking about the soldiers. He wasn't just talking about the Sanhedrin. He was talking about the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, right down to you and me, because you and I put him there. I said, he forgave us before we ever said, I'm sorry. Do you know how many times I've had people come up to me and say, well, I'll forgive them when they apologize. If Jesus would have, wait, listen, would have waited for you to apologize, he never would have forgiven you. You would have been in hell. Jesus chose to forgive you before you ever said, I'm sorry. I said, your unfulfilled revenge is just the wanting of your ex-husband to come back and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I said, you know what? That's what's kept you in captivity all these years. I want you to see this one more time before we go into the final lesson. In Romans 12, we read again in verse 17, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God says, Vengeance is mine. He said, You are not to take vengeance. Why? Because He is the judge. When we determine that somebody owes us something, we put ourselves in the place of the judge. And according to James chapter 4, verse 12, and James chapter 5, verse 9, let me read it to you. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? Do not grumble against one another, brethren. Folks, this is a command. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Can I read that one more time? Do not grumble or complain. Or gripe against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Folks, God is the just judge. He will pass the righteous judgment. Amen? Amen. He will repay according to righteousness, folks. Now listen, if somebody's done wrong and genuinely repents, that means what? That Jesus will release them. But somebody will say, but yeah, but what they did was against me. Not Jesus. But you have to remember what you did to Jesus. Are you with me? But he chose to freely forgive when you and I didn't deserve it. See, folks, if you really want to know the truth, we are talking about the very foundation of Calvary. Yeah. This is Christianity. This is when you release somebody that doesn't deserve to be released. This is why Jesus comes along and he says, Hey, I want to change your whole way of thinking. See, do you know what the word holiness really means? Do you know what the word holiness really means? Holiness is from the Hebrew word kadosh, which simply means this. This is the pure definition of it, a cut above. Let me say cut above. You know, if you're making, if you used to be back in the days when ladies made outfits, if you went to a material store, you'd have average fabrics. You'd have nice fabrics, very nice fabrics, and then you have this one fabric that's a cut above all of them, right? 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 When God says, be holy as I am holy, what he's speaking of is he's speaking of his 
his relationship to his creation. He is an infinite cut above his creation. So when he says, be holy as I am holy, he's saying, I don't think like you. I don't talk like you. My ways are not like your ways. Come up to my level of living. What he's saying is this, folks. You see, he's not talking about wearing your hair a certain way and not wearing makeup and having a dress and a bun. You can have a bun and a dress down to your ankles and have a seducing spirit up to your eyeballs. That's not holiness. Okay? <laughs> Amen? What he's saying is this. Why do you want to hang around with the turkeys in the barnyard when I've called you to soar with eagles? You need to think like I think, speak like I speak, and think like I think. That is why Jesus comes along in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42, and he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That is revenge. But he said, but I tell you, now here comes the higher level of thinking. Are you ready? But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Did God resist you before you got saved? Amon, I asked the question, where's the answer? Not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn him to, to him the other. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying the way, listen, the way the love of God works is the love of God will risk being hurt again. Now, I'm going to get into reconciliation in the next lesson. We're going to make that real clear. But look at this. Turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your coat also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. This is kingdom level thinking, folks. This is not revenge thinking. Revenge thinking is the way of the world. It is the way of darkness. It is sensual. It is demonic. It is earthly. It is the wisdom that ascends from below. Are you with me? But the wisdom that descends from above is, first of all, pure, gentle, easy to be entreated, willing to yield, full of good fruits and mercy. God's saying, come up to my level of thinking. Come up to my level of living. How can an offense from another put a wall between you and God? John explains this as he delves into his own personal testimony in the last lesson the Bait of Satan curriculum, Escaping the Trap. The Bait of Satan curriculum is just one of many teachings available from John Bevere Ministries on video and audio tapes, DVDs and CDs, and of course, our extensive book library. You can also ask for a copy of the Messenger newsletter and our product catalog, both free, by logging onto our website at johnbevere.org or by writing to John Bevere Ministries at our world headquarters, P.O. Box 888, Palmer Lake, Colorado 80133, or telephone toll free 1 800 648 1477. In the UK, address P.O. Box 622 Newport, NP20, 4WR, United Kingdom, phone 0870 745 5790. And in Australia, write P.O. Box 6200, Dural, D.C., New South Wales, 2158, phone 1300 650 577.